expecting more. I don't think so. I think I got it confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can share it. I looked at this piece of paper you passed out. The first thing I saw was all that three and I saw the little screen. Then I wandered and saw the rest of it. Yeah, I have that. The Greek and then a very literalistic translation in English and then the NIV and then the New Living Translation, which is a paraphrase. And often when we go through, I'll note how it's just helpful to note how the different translations change. That's why I use Bible though. Yeah, yeah, because they have I'm lots of them there. I'm like, yeah, I'm in plain English. I'm like, okay, let's roll with that for a while. <laughs> it caused me problems in my, with my Mormon brethren uh, when I would speak up in their Bible study. And I'm reading from, you know, a plain translation. It's supposed to be, hey, it's 18 cubits wide. I'm like, it's about 35 yards long. And <laughs> I'm hearing all these objections. And, uh, but that's what happens. All right. Well, let's, let's open with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for new friends that have come to visit us. Lord, you are God over all the earth. And you have many people in this city and in many other cities. So we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to read and to discuss and to look at the look at the Gospel of John. So give us your peace and open the eyes of our heart. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. John chapter 1. I'm going to read the LEB just because... Many of you are used to the NIV, and I often find that if you read in a different translation, it jogs different things in your mind. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This was in the beginning, uh, this one was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. A man came, sent from God, whose name was John. This one came for a witness, in order that he could testify about the light, so that all would come to believe through him. That one was not the light, but came in order that he could testify about the light. The true light, who gives light to every person, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, and the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, he came to his own thing, and his own people did not, did not receive him. But as many as received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave to them authority to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a husband, but of God. And the word became flesh and took up residence among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the one and only, from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This one who he this one was he about whom I said, The one who comes after me is ahead of me, because he existed before me. For from his fullness we have all received, and grace after grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. No one has seen God at any time, the one and only God, the one who is in the bosom of the Father, that one has made him known. Okay, you can see that. But well, often what 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 many in the class comment is that you go from one to the next, it seems easier to understand. The difficulty with that is which e with each successive column, in a sense, the word is pre-chewed. 
And so it's translated and it's put into forms that, that you find familiar. The downside of that familiarity is that you might not be able to see it in a new way and it tends to reinforce your old way of thinking, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the goal is to, is to have the Bible shape us and not just have the Bible reinforce, reinforce what we already think. Now, having read through this chapter and this other translation, what things jumped out at you that we read? number of elements in there that are important. Uh, a couple of weeks ago we talked about this idea that um, coming... This is, this is John the Baptist. This is John the Baptist that's saying this. And John the Baptist was born, if you read Luke, John the Baptist was born before Jesus. Now my wife and I have been continuing to watch these Korean dramas. And Korean dramas are fun because they give you an insight into another culture. And it's, they're not explaining their culture to you, but you're just kind of watching it. And, and in Korean culture, they pay a great deal of attention to age. If I am addressing, if I would address Mori, Mori is older than I am, and so I, my, I would actually use a different form of language addressing Maury. Spanish has an element of this too. There's the formal and the familiar in terms of the second person. And, and so the Korean language has this. And, and this is all behind the idea that that which comes first has a certain degree of status. status. Yes. Has a certain degree of status over that which comes later. And this culture, the culture that Jesus is working in here, very much has an idea of, well, the village elders. And when you see that word, that word has multiple meanings, doesn't it? On one sense, these are the people in the village that are older. They, they're maybe in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. It also means these are the, these are the people that um, are ruling, or they're the leaders of the village. And you notice those two ideas come into this one word. A lot of languages have this. In fact, Mr. Now we hear the word Mr. We think, well, that's Mr. Roos. So we're talking about more is a male, so he'd be Miss, Mr. Roos. Now, any idea where this word comes from? Master. Master. It's an updated version of the older Master Roos. Then you notice right away, Master has both age and status. Spanish, senor, same, it's basically the same as master. Now if you read the Bible, this word Lord, same word. And what you'll notice is that this word in the Bible, Lord, well, it has lots of different nuances. If you're reading a, your NIV and the Old Testament, one of the things that you'll notice is that there's L-O-R-D, lowercase letters, and L-O-R-D, small caps. In your English Bible, this word means Yahweh. 
which is the name of God. This word means all of these words here. Now, why would modern translations render the name of God Lord with small caps? Any ideas? The remember that the Now, we often say, try to say this Yahweh. We're not 100% sure that's why it was said. That's how it was said. Why don't we know how it was said? It's not, not, supposed to say it. not supposed to say it. Jews today even will write something like this instead of because they're avoiding saying the name. Because the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So in order to be very careful about not taking the name of the Lord in vain, they never said this word. Because, well, it, if you say it, you run the risk of offending, so you're not going to say it. So what did they say? Adonai. And what does Adonai mean? Lord. <laughs> Master. Senor. All of those things Adonai means. And so often in a Jewish service, and they're reading along, they'll say Elohim, which is basically the generic word God, because that's not actually a name. This is the name. And they'll read along and they'll say, Elohim, the Lord your God. They won't say Yahweh, they'll say Adonai Elohim, as in Lord. And, well, this, gets, this got very interesting because there's the, there's the word Jehovah, which around the 19th century, that showed up in everybody's Bible instead of this. And where this word comes from is the, um, the Hebrews, it goes the other way around, but then they would put vowel points under the letters to kind of give, tell you the vowels because these are just the consonants. And what they did was they took the vowels from Adonai, put it on Yahweh, and that actually yielded Jehovah. So towards, at the beginning of the 20th century, the scholars realized that this word was actually a mistake, and so that's why it's fallen out of use. It'll, you'll still find it in some older books and some songs, but scholars don't use this word anymore because they recognize that it was just simply a mistake. They didn't understand what the Jews were doing in terms of, you just took the vowels from Adonai, put it on Yahweh, and came up with Jehovah. And so that's why this word isn't used, except, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is this group that grew up in the 19th century when they thought that that was how the name was said. And so that's why that name can endures with that community. But this idea of Lord, Master, Senor, Adonai, all of these things are together and, well, I, I mentioned before there was a, there was a there was a Volkswagen commercial where everyone's excited to see these new Volkswagens and this guy runs up to the car and licks it. And you might think, well, well why did the guy run up to the car and lick it? What was he saying? So it was my... I got there first. In fact, even, you know, some of you are, you know, follow my YouTube channel. It's funny because every time I post a video, there's a little game that it's not just my channel, but a lot of channels on YouTube to be the first commenter. And so the first one who can get to the video will, will just write in and say first. And it's, it's just a little, it's like a child children's game that you play, it's just kind of fun. But it's this whole idea. Now John the Baptist says, everyone in the culture, because John the Baptist was older than Jesus, would look at John the Baptist and say, he must be the greater. And John makes the point here, he's not the greater, he's the lesser, because he's saying something very, very strange. 
Now, God, we've talked about hierarchies before, God is at the top of the hierarchy, and you'll notice that way at the beginning of the verse, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This one was in the beginning with God. Now, we're obviously talking about Jesus. But here's the difficulty. What do we mean by this word God, and how can a man who has a mother who is walking around in the world that was born at a certain time be called God? That's a really hard thing to think about. It's not so hard for us because we have been living with Christianity for a very long time. As I mentioned before, what was more common was that someone would be called a son of God. I've mentioned this before. Can anyone remember a person in history, and in fact, were many of them, who were called a son of God? The Japanese emperors. Japanese emperors. Emperors are often called sons of God. Why would emperors be called sons of God? They're inheriting the structure they sit on top of. Yes. They're sitting on top of a structure. They inherit it. Now, one of the, one of the examples I've used before, Alexander the Great. the Great. Alexander the Great was called the Son of God which is a funny thing, because everybody knew that, well, who was Alexander the Great's father? Philip of Macedonia. Philip of Macedonia. And he was a king. And it's like, well, how can he be the son of God when he's the son of Philip? So then you have to ask the question, what do they mean by a son of God? And why do they often use it for emperors? You see, this, this wasn't a title that was necessarily given, like, I am the son of Stan. And there was Stan, and then Stan and Barb got together, and then Paul came, and Ruth, and Lori. So Paul is the son of Stan. Now everybody knows I'm the son of Stan, and no, that's not... That's not about question, but what does it mean to say the Son of God? And what does it mean to say he was with God and he was God? And again, the idea that this was often given to emperors. Emperors were also known as king of kings. And you might hear that and say, well, wait a minute. I've heard that phrase before. Jesus is a king of kings. And Lord of Lords. Oh, there's that other word. What does it mean to be a Lord of Lords? Top. There's all these Lords down here. And then there's this Lord that's above all the other Lords. King of Kings. So there's all these Kings. So Herod in, Herod in Jerusalem was King. And Caesar was the king of kings because the Caesar would dictate who could be king in different places. Now, now all of this stuff is simply assumed by the Bible because the audiences to whom the Bible was written all knew this stuff. They didn't have to sit down and explain it. But this is part of the reason why it's really helpful to learn history, to read the Bible, because... Again, all of this is assumed. And so when we talk about a son of God, well, what are we saying? And why could Alexander the Great be a son of God when he was the son of Philip of Macedonia? What did they mean by this word? I think um, my thoughts are saying that, um, that 
And I can look at Alexander the Great, well, that's the son of Philip, but the whole world at the time is like, no, this is a new thing, that's a new guy, and this is a new order, and, you know, yeah, he inherited the built-up army and the techniques, and stuff, but now God, just whatever, removed him and put the new guy on top, and it's a new thing. So when he's not the son of the son of the son of the son of the, which takes your mind and goes back in history, it's what's happening right now. Is that something like that? Yes, yes. And a lot of it has to do with what we mean by this word here, God. Now, is it true that that word is an Anglo-Saxon contraction of the word good? They just removed one O. Boy, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's, but, that's, but, the, that's the delusion I'm laboring under. But it could, it could very well be connected it's because they're, they're so close. I, I would have to look that up. And it's also just related to the idea of that God is the God of the ever-present now, not yesterday, but he's the same as yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But aren't we designed or being schooled to look at the newness of the day under God rather than what happened yesterday? Uh, that's some... what, what I'm getting at is there's a functional aspect to this word. And, and you will hear us, we'll slip into this language sometimes. You, we might, maybe we're watching LeBron James play basketball, and someone might say, he's a god. Right. Now, when you say that of LeBron James, you don't mean he created the world, you don't, you, what do, why would someone say of LeBron James, he's a god? He's the only one doing what he's Top of his profession. Top of his profession. Right. He's the greatest. He's the greatest. When he's on the basketball court and they're playing basketball, he reigns. Right. And what does it mean that, I mean, they call him King James, right? <laughs> what does it mean when we say LeBron James reigns? He's in total control. He's in total control. He's in total control of the game. That even though there's there's nine other players on that court. He, the entire game is revolving around him. In offense, they're all in coordination with him. In defense, they're all trying to stop him. What, does, what then does this word God mean? To this dude. That, that's, a, that's, very much a, that's very much getting at it. Historic person in control of the then known world? Well, and this person idea is really important because there are many conceptions of God that are impersonal. Is there any difference between children and God? Uh -huh. We so, saw that in this, in this passage too, didn't we? Didn't they say Prime mover unmoved. Well, now we're getting into Aristotle. Okay, and what about then? It's, it's the core of the intention. It's but, like the guy who is, the game is organized around him. The defense to defeat him is organized around him. He is the focal point. That's right. The tip of the spear. He's the focal point of the entire operation. But now, the difficulty, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of conceptions that wants to see God as impersonal, as, as sort of, the sum total, C.S. Lewis calls it the whole show, the sum total of all of what's happening, the difficulty we have with that, and the reason why I think this conception of God continues to fail is because personhood and agency for us is so demonstrably powerful. You might walk in the room and there's a lot to this room that you have to contend with. The chairs are all in a certain place, the table's in a certain place, but when you come into this room, if you start rearranging the furniture, personhood trumps impersonality. And so that's why when Marty said person or God or agent, that's really built in to this whole idea. Now, when you get to Aristotle, this prime mover, we're back to this idea of older because God is the first mover. God gets everything going. God is 
first among all of this. And that's exactly what Lily focused in on. John the Baptist comes and says, Jesus was before me. And if you look at, if you look at the other two translations of verse 15, the NIV puts it in parentheses. It sees it as a parenthetical comment, sort of out of the flow of the rest of the text. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. That's all of that all idea about age and status. If you go to the NLT, John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. And see, part of the reason I always complain about paraphrases, or at least say you should always understand what a paraphrase is, because they're basically trying to interpret verse 15 and render an interpretation rather than a translation. That's why you see it's almost always longer than the other ones. But it's, it's all of these ideas are compressed. Now when part of the, the strangeness of, so you look at Alexander the Great and you look at the amount of the world that he conquered and people would say, he clearly was a son of God because he, like LeBron James, mastered the world. That's what a son of God is. Now, what about Jesus? Now, you would, in terms of this definition, you would easily say that about Alexander the Great. Jesus, compared to Alexander the Great, what does he look like? Kicked down, kick down the street. Kicked down the street. I mean, everybody, nobody in the we're, sons of God don't die on crosses because crosses are for political enemies of the King of Kings in Rome. They are the losers. And here, John. Well, we're at the beginning of the story. John, here setting up for Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist says, wow, all of these things about Jesus. He was before him. And John, the book of John, John writing this book says, in the beginning was the word, the logos, and the logos was with God and the logos was God. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Now, we get this idea back to this English word. Master. What is the difference often between a master and a maker? Well, so, sometimes, often a maker is a master. Master chefs, master bakers. Well, especially in, in terms of a a maker, if you make if you make a machine, everybody comes in and everybody comes in and sees. Let's say, let's say it's a computer. It's a little black or a beige box. And that black or a beige box is hooked up to another thing. And on that thing are all words and pictures and there's a little keyboard and a little mouse and it's you know, all connected to that machine. And you come in and it's like, wow. This is amazing. And you sit down and you type into it and you use it. And then one day it stops working. What do you do? You kick it. You kick, <laughs> you kick it. You're angry with it. You might want to look for a maker of this. Because the person that made this 
in a, is in a sense the master over it. And when it comes to this idea of God in the world, well, he's the maker. He's created it, so he's the master of it. But now, here's the weird thing. There's this idea that, well, someone must have made the world. Someone, if, if I want to... If I want to be in touch or in dialogue with, so maybe your computer isn't working, and maybe the manufacturer of the cube computer is Hewlett Packard, HP. So you call HP, and you talk to one of their representatives, they're sort of a son of God on the phone, and you say, my computer won't start. And they'll say, check and make sure it's plugged in. And in many cases, it's, oh, yeah, the, the, the breaker trip. So, okay, so then your computer starts. So, yes, I've got power. It's beeping at me. And, and they'll run through a whole series of steps to get this computer working again. They are the maker of the computer, and they have dominion over the computer. But now here we've got the world. And... This is, people for a very, very long time have thought that God and or the gods, because often it was assumed that there were little gods, because there was the God of gods, you know, there's a hierarchy here, that these were what was running the world. And that, well, maybe there's a calamity in your little corner of the world and there's a flood. Well, what caused the flood? Well, the little God. And the little God is answerable to the big God. And so it's not very different from your computer and HP in terms of the way that this whole system is working. Now, and so you would, what you would do is you would, there'd be a temple and there'd be sacrifices going up to the God. The God lives in the sky and this is basically how the world would work. And you want, to, you want to keep the gods happy so that the gods give you good things. Now, Jesus comes along, and of course the Jews had very particular ideas about God, and they didn't really have, well... I was going to say they didn't really have gods, but in a sense... They did. They had Elohim. They had all these Elohim. If you watch the Bible Project, you'll notice that that's a, that's a thing on YouTube. The Elohim is a word that the Hebrews in the Bible would use of not just Yahweh Elohim, the God, but all of these powers down below. Today we might call them angels and demons or principalities and powers or spirits or what have you. But you had this rich spiritual ecosystem in the Old Testament world. Now, everybody understood this. And they understood when Alexander the Great would come and Alexander the Great would conquer. And everybody watched that happen. And when Alexander the Great conquered... Oh, come on in, come on. When Alexander the Great conquered, everybody would say, he's a son of God. And now Jesus comes, and John says, nobody would say of Alexander the Great, he was God. They'd say he was a son of God, because like LeBron James, he mastered the court. But no one would say of Alexander the Great, he was God. But John, a Jew, says of Jesus, he was God and he was with God from the beginning. And John the Baptist says, Jesus was before him, even though John the Baptist was older than Jesus. What on earth would they mean by calling Jesus God? He's the original creator of personification. Okay, that's a crazy thing to say. Yeah. Go ahead, Carmen. 
And he didn't know that yet. They were just getting their mind wrapped around that idea. The Jews, were, the Jews didn't sit there and say, well, we've got two more slots waiting to be revealed. Because if, if you were a Jew and you said, oh, you know, there's a trinity, well, you'd probably get stoned. <laughs> which, which was a big part of the contention between what they said about this Jesus. And, and so again, right away, we have to begin to get an idea of the strangeness of this entire enterprise that the Gospel of John is going about. Because everyone in the world would have understood, well, Alexander the Great, he's a son of the gods. And the emperor in Rome, he's a son of the gods. And, and now, it was important also to see that the emperors in Rome were not moral exemplars. Okay? And Alexander the Great wasn't necessarily a moral exemplar. Alexander the Great could pretty much do whatever he wanted to do because he was a son of the gods. But to say this of a man like Jesus would, would simply make very little sense to almost anyone else in the world because they would say, now Alexander the Great I see your point there, because look at everything he conquered. Look at how successful he was in battle. Look at how wealthy he became. Jesus has none of that in his story. Then you have to begin to ask the question, what about Jesus would lead anyone to talk about him in this way. That's a really hard thing to think about. Now right away, one of the things that comes to mind are the miracles. Why would the miracles lend people to imagine Jesus could be the Son of God and even be with God in the beginning? any of the things that Jesus did. So that was one of the, the clues there, that he was somebody special, not just, you know, a medical person or whatever, but, you know, he could do these things and keep moving, not focus on them. Okay. So very much the miracles would give them the idea of Jesus as a son of God. But now I want to play around with that a little bit because one of the interesting things that people in the Bible have noticed was that a lot of Jesus' miracles were sort of done on a smaller scale by Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament, which is really interesting. Um, but Jesus seems to do them bigger. So, so the miracles are a piece of it, and we don't want to discount that because... Go ahead, Marty. Wasn't it some of the uh, disciples, though, they, they did miracles? Yes, they did. Yeah. But now, one of the things that you might or might not have noticed in this passage was the reference... Da, 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 da. <coughs> Verse 12, but as many as received him to those who believed in his name. Now notice, when the disciples do miracles, how do they do them? In the name of Jesus. What does that mean when disciples do miracles in the name of Jesus? Um, they, they, that. Like when you pound on the door and you say open up in the name of the king, the person behind the door knows that that's not really the king, but it is. Exactly. So right away you see that open this up, you know, in the name of the king or in the name of, in our, in after English common law, in the name of the law. And we say things like, no man is above the law. When we say no man is above the law, what do we mean? Everyone has the same standard of behavior in codes. And everyone must submit to the law. The law is, in a sense, divinized. But now, 
the disciples do miracles in the name of Jesus. So they're using his authority. So the miracles are a piece of this. And, and in the ancient world, people would understand, and this is part of the reason that the, the Gospels are so, were so important for the spread of Christianity that saying, well, this Jesus could do could still a storm and bring people back to life. Now remember when I said basketball and King James? I mean, everything, everything revolves around the court when LeBron James is playing. Well, with Jesus, everything revolved around Jesus when Jesus was in the room, when Jesus was in the venue. Now, so the miracles are a piece of this, there's got to be more though. There's got to be more in terms of in terms of why John the Baptist and why the author of, of the book of John, the John who writes this story, why they would say such things about Jesus. So miracles. Any other ideas? why they would connect Jesus and God. He returned to life after death. Okay, resurrection. What does that show? Endless life. Something unhuman. Yeah, something above the game, yes. Well, wouldn't it also be the Holy Spirit's influence as well? Because I think there's a passage where Jesus asked Peter, how do you know that I am the Son of God? And he says, it has been revealed to you, not by man, but by the power of the Spirit. So isn't there a distinct influence of knowing through or believing through this God, the Holy Spirit? So now we're, da now we're down to Carmen's Trinity here. We got there, didn't we? God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. But now you've also added a whole lot more complexity to this, and we're going to get into this at the sermon. When you say Holy Spirit, what on earth do you mean? Uh, I mean, I believe in the Father. <laughs> no, 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 I get all that, but I want, I, want, I, want an, I, want an, I want an articulation of this in plain language. Something that moves you? Ah, see, Joanne has been paying attention in the Sunday school class. <laughs> We spent a number of weeks talking about spirit. Something that moves you. Because what does Jesus say in John 3, 8 about, he gives us this idea of what the spirit is. He says, you don't see it. It's like the what? Wind. Wind. And again, wind in the Old and New Testament, in the Hebrew and in the Greek, the same word for wind is the same word for spirit. You could call this the holy wind. <laughs> and you say that in English and people, that, that, that sounds blasphemous, that sounds naughty. But in Greek, it's amazing, in Greek and Hebrew, the same word for spirit is the same word for wind. And Jesus plays on that in John 3, 8, when he says, you see, right now I'm looking out that window behind Marty and I see the leaves just kind of shimmering. And if I didn't understand wind, I might say, oh, that, that bush is alive. It's moving on its own. And one of you would say, oh, silly pastor. That's just the spirit. <laughs> That's just the spirit. The spirit is moving the bush. And if I'd say it that way, people would be like, well, what's the pastor mean? But if I say the wind is moving the bush, nobody would pay any attention because, oh, well, there's this wind that blows and the trees move. So what is this Holy Spirit? It's, it's, uh, it's, okay. Um... <laughs> So the son or, or the child of the king 
who has the same spirit as the king. He's not the wayward son that runs away. He, he's totally the same party line. And so he's, a, he's inheriting the spirit of his father. And, and so you can replace the man, but you've got a good son, and he grows into the king. And you're like, wow, two in a row. That's really rare, son. They don't really happen like that. Usually the kid's are rotten, you know. And so there's that going on. There's the same breath. And then um, um, I learned from uh, Dr. Gene Scott, the ABCs of faith. Um, actions based in belief, sustained by confidence. Action, an act of the will. Um, com uh, sustained starts with S. Uh, confidence. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> based in belief sustained by confidence. Oh, confidence. Okay. So action and act of the will, belief and act of the mind, confidence and act of the emotions. Um, belief is that upon which I'm prepared to act. It's not an existential truth claim. And then uh, confidence is con fidelity. Fidelity means true to the original. It, and the original is God. So the more you fulfill God's platinum rod that sits in France at the state's weights and measures it. When you measure up to that, you have this confidence because you've measured up to the original. And so the father's the original, and when he makes a, a, a son, and the son measures up to the original, I think John here is saying, hey, all you people out there, I know you know what a king of kings is. I know you know what the emperor is. I know you recognize the world you're living in. And I'm telling you that this one who has come to say, Yahshua, I think his name is, uh, is up, up there on equal to the, the father, the original. And you can see that from his mercy. And well, we will see it eventually through his miracles because I, I, I'm reaching here, but so far he didn't do bad things with his miracle making. He, he, he healed a blind man, he rose someone who died and shouldn't have died that quickly or something. And um, he turned water into wine to keep the party going. And, uh, and then, he, you know, I'm out. Go ahead, Kevin. <clears throat> you mentioned to try to explain the spirit in layman's terms. Um, I think one of the issues is you you can't talk about it without getting at least a little bit technical, because when we define, or at least from what I've read of the way we define God is as much in how we do not characterize as how much we characterize. So when we refer to the spirit, we know that it's timeless, immaterial. Right? We we. It is not bounded in time. It is not bound by any material object. At the same time, it is blank. It is blank. But, but none of this says what it does. And I think... The, and that's what... So the Son of God, in terms of Alexander the Great, Son of God ex, expresses dominion over the world. I think then you just have to go back to the simplest way to put it is what it does is it is the first cause. It is the cause of everything. Sustaining cause and sustainment. And this is why when, when both of these guys are talking, what you hear ringing are all of these church councils that are trying to get a handle on the Trinity and they ask things like, well, is, 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 is this like number one, number two, and number three? Or does one come before two and before three? And the creeds say, no, they're all co-eternal. They say, well, is one more, does one have more authority than number two and number three? And they say, no, they're all of equal status. And in fact, they say they're all of the same essence. But then they say there are three persons. And so now we're just in the middle of the whole Trinitarian controversy. But what I, what I want to help us to see is that very much as Joanna said, the Holy Spirit here moves. And, and what you notice from the beginning of the Gospel of John here, that John is saying, well, we haven't talked about the Holy Spirit much yet. That Holy Spirit will, will come in more obviously in the later parts of the book. 
But this Jesus is God with God in the beginning and through the miracles, through the resurrection, so through his deeds, what he does, what happens to him, but also the strength, the most amazing thing about this Jesus is that those who follow him, those who live like he lived and die like he dies, and those, he, he somehow changes reality. For this, now we just finished going through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He changes reality for this whole community. The world now is a different place because of him. And so even where Alexander the Great, well the world was a different place because of Alexander the Great, but it was in a sense the same old place. Because before there was Alexander the Great, there was Sargon of Akkad, and there was Nebuchadnezzar. And so when we saw Alexander the Great, we saw Nebuchadnezzar and, and Cyrus and all of these other emperors. So in a sense, Alexander the Great sort of dominated the world and then died. But these followers of Jesus come after him and say, he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and reigns over an eternal kingdom. And everyone else kind of listens to that and says, but wait a minute, you guys are getting hauled off by your enemies and killed. How can you keep saying that? Because winners like Alexander the Great, we know they win because they kill people. They kill, Alexander the Great kills his enemies. You Christians are killed by your enemies. How, why on earth do you say that you reign? And they have a real point. But there's another crazy point. We're sitting in this room 2,000 years later still talking about Jesus. And there are groups of people all over the world singing things like, He is Lord and He reigns. And you say, that's weird. How did he change the story of the world in a radical way? Who has more power, Jesus or Alexander the Great? And you might say, well, Alexander the Great sure showed a lot of power, but in time, that power collapsed, and then his generals fought over the scraps of his empire. But this Jesus continues to conquer. And you might say, well, he doesn't exactly conquer like Alexander the Great, does he? No. How does he conquer? What does he conquer with? How does he change the story? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think he's, he's collecting the, the minds and spirits of men and, and transporting them out of the, the here and now world of kings and crosses and gruesome deaths and obediences and puts them into a, another world that they can live in simultaneously. And that, so when Jesus is in front of Pilate and says, well, don't you know I can have you killed? And Jesus' answer is like, well, that's because my father heaven, elsewhere, uh, he's given you that authority. And so he, he's taken the, 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 the battle I gave the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Zealots, I think they all have different sort of philosophies, and then there's the rest of the world, and all these regular people are like, you know, is there an afterlife? Or is this just it? Is there an afterlife? Or is this just mommy what happens to me after, you know, what happened to my little sister? Where'd she go? You know, it's like eventually, you know, Jesus and John and John the Baptist says, no, we're talking, we're talking the mansions in the sky. We're talking, I call came later, but I think, I think he's taking his mind, the minds of his audience and saying, no, there is a place where you know it's wrong, that uh, injustice and dad was innocent and the Romans came and killed him anyway because someone else ratted on him in a, in a lie. So they had to live with this injustice of the law, the law's delay. And, and then, you know, that, that can breed total resentment and, 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 and rebellion. And so Jesus was looking at his rebellious stiff-necked Jews, and, and they were hell-bound in front of the Romans. And he, he said, he, 
he, God said, God made it all happen. He said, you know, I'm going to have to capture the minds of these my, my sheep. They hear my voice. I'll, I'll talk to them, and I'll transport them into a, another world where there's no pain. There's justice, true justice. And if you live there, but you are here, and then when the world tries to crush you, to make you lie so that they can keep their delusion going along there with their fellows, you know, and you just, you don't know, I'll take the lines, thank you very much. You know, That's right. because the truth is up there in the real world. And when you guys are playing around down here, calling yourself kings, calling yourself king of kings, you're nothing. He, Jesus changes. And with Alexander the Great, the, with Alexander the Great, the same old rules apply. Jesus changes all the rules, just like just like he described. Gee, the whole world starts to play slowly, but it grows, and it's still growing, starts to play by different rules because of what Jesus said, what Jesus did, what Jesus lived, and what's astounding. See, we look back now, 2,000 years later, and say, well, I can see that. I can look at the world and see how Jesus changed the world. What's crazy is that within a few decades of Jesus' life, they saw this when the world hadn't changed at all. That's when people say, well, the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about. How on earth could they have known this? Because there's lots of ancient writings making lots of claims. This one's still standing. That's astounding. We don't recognize it because we simply live within it. But when you think about how Jesus changed the world, like he just described, they could see it right away and said, Jesus is God. And the word, Jesus is the Logos. And the world dwelt among us. And it's Phenomenal. That's why this book continues to change the world. And it's astounding that it was written 2,000 years ago when to say this kind of thing just sounded like crazy talk. But these people that were around Jesus saw it so clearly and were so willing to live it, it became the world. We're out of time. Let's pray. Lord, there's so much here that we understand, sort of, but, but, but we can't get our minds around it. We can't quite grasp it. But it's true, and, and we sort of know it, but sometimes we doubt it. But, but this idea that Jesus was Lord more Lord than Alexander the Great is, is something that we can sort of demonstrate by just looking at the world, but we also doubt by looking at the world. And so we have this book, and this book teaches us and begins to reshape our minds and changes us. And so we ask, Lord, that you would be with us as we are changed by your Spirit. As your spirit blows through us and remakes us and remolds us, help us, Lord, to, to be remade. Remake us by your spirit. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.